So if you've been watching the video series and paying attention, well, it's remarkable that we've been able to get this 2,046 pound car with a 719 cc diesel engine to accelerate almost as fast as an East German built two cylinder, two stroke Trabant. And so far we've somehow managed to avoid catastrophic engine failure. So in today's episode, we're going to advance the injector pump timing and bump the boost up to 12 PSI, and we're not going to touch the fuel settings. The reason we won't be adjusting the fuel settings is, well, we still have excessive exhaust gas temperatures at full throttle, and we want to see if advancing the injector pump timing helps, and then we'll bump the boost up and see if that helps. Don't worry, we still have plenty of fuel adjustment left, but today let's see if we can bring those exhaust gas temperatures down. Now after we do our performance testing, then we'll check the fuel consumption and see if that goes up or down. So the first thing we're going to do is advance the injector pump timing, and for point of reference, this is somewhat similar to advancing the ignition timing on a gasoline engine. Anyway, advancing the injector pump timing should help us squeeze a little bit more power from this tiny engine. On a Kubota engine like this D722, well, we really don't have a lot of options as far as advancing the injector pump timing. And the simplest way is to pull the injector pump and remove the timing shims that are located between the pump and the engine block. Let's take a look at a cartoon. So here we have the injector pump, and we'll draw this line here to represent the engine block. Down here we have the roller lifters for each of the injectors. In our case we have three rollers because, well, we're dealing with a three-cylinder engine. Now these roller lifters are pushed up when the injector camshaft rotates, so let's add the camshaft to the picture. Hopefully this makes sense so far. Basically we have the injector pump and the injector pump camshaft. So between the injector pump and the engine block, there are timing shims, and these shims or spacers move the pump off the engine block a tiny amount. Now if we remove some of the shims, well, that'll move the pump down into the engine block and closer to the injector camshaft. So what that means is, the injector pump rollers will contact the camshaft sooner when the camshaft rotates. It may be hard to wrap your head around all this, but this is how the injector timings fine-tune on a Kubota engine. Apparently, by removing some of these shims, we should see a noticeable increase in power. Now, in case you're wondering, the purpose of these shims is to allow the engine to be tuned at the factory for the most amount of power while keeping the emissions of oxides of nitrogen as low as possible. So that's the cartoon version, which falls under the category of easier said than done. Let's take a look at how we're actually going to do this. Well, the injector pump is buried on the back side of this engine. In our case, there's a bunch of stuff that gets in the way. Let's take a look. This could be worse. Let me get the intercooler out of the way, and then we can take a better look. All right, the intercooler is out of the way. Now we can see the injector pump a little bit better. But these cooling lines are in the way now. So let me drain the cooling system so I can disconnect the hoses. I'll be right back. Okay, now we have clear access to the pump and all the stuff associated with it. Let me set the camera up for an overhead shot so you folks can watch how this is all done. At this point, we're dealing with nuts and bolts in order to dig the injector pump out. While I take care of business, let's talk about some of the comments I got in the previous Saturn video. So if you watched the previous video, well, I got a lot of grief for increasing the boost from 8 PSI to 10 PSI without also increasing the fuel. And I guess that's my fault for not explaining why I left the fuel settings alone. So to be clear, the current fuel setting that we're running is too much. And what I mean by that is, the exhaust gas temperatures are still too high at full throttle. When I adjusted the boost from 8 PSI to 10 PSI, I was of course looking for more boost because I was aware that the engine had plenty of fuel to take advantage of the increase in boost. Now how did I know that? Well, the exhaust gas temperatures told me that the engine was begging for more air. It's that simple. Give this people air! You see, in order to lower the exhaust gas temperatures on a diesel, just add more air. And that's what we did. If you go back and rewatch the previous episode, we managed to set a new record time and we did the 0 to 60 in 31.97 seconds. But we also did it without triggering the exhaust gas temperature alarm. Now, to be fair, the alarm did go off a few moments after we hit 60 miles per hour, but that was edited out. Typically, the alarm comes on well before we hit 60. Anyway, that's why I increased the boost without giving the engine more fuel. Alright, we got the high pressure injector pipes off. Now we can dig out the pump. Anyway, the point I'm trying to make is, we tune this engine for maximum power at full throttle. Now, we do have self-imposed limits, and we have to take into consideration the exhaust gas temperatures at full throttle while the engine's under a load. 
The alarm on the exhaust gas temperature gauge is set to go off at 1150 degrees, which is still well within the safety zone. However, when the alarm goes off, that means we more or less have 10 seconds before we hit the critical limit. Now the dangerous game we're playing with this engine is, we're allowing it to hit 1400 degrees Fahrenheit for a few moments. Now keep in mind, when the exhaust gas temperature hits 1400 degrees Fahrenheit, it still takes time for the heat to penetrate the pistons and to reach the piston rings. And it's the piston rings that we are primarily concerned with. You see, the piston rings on this engine are not properly gapped to function at 1400 degrees Fahrenheit. And if we ignore all the warnings, well, the piston rings will expand from the excessive heat and cause serious engine damage. I think pretty much in every video we focus on the exhaust gas temperature as we tune this engine for more power at full throttle. All right, now we got the injector pump out, and basically all it took was disconnecting the high pressure fuel lines and unscrewing a few bolts. We'll get back to this pump in a minute. So right down here we can see a gasket. Well, that's actually both a gasket and a shim for the injector pump. This engine should have a stack of three shims under the pump, and our plan is to remove two of these shims, so let's do that. So that's one shim. Wow, these are very thin. And here's the second shim. We're gonna leave the last shim in place because it's also a gasket and we need something to keep the, you know, oil from escaping. Anyway, these are the two shims that we took out and I'll put them in a safe location so I can restore the injector pump timing in the future. So this is the injector pump and this little guy is insanely expensive. So we'll try to be careful with it. Now this thingy right here is the actual throttle for this engine. I know it seems so small, it's not what you were expecting a throttle to look like, but here it is. Anyway, the throttle is connected to a convoluted mechanism which is part of the governor, and that's why we haven't disconnected or bypassed the governor on this engine. Now the only thing we have done is adjust the governor to allow way more throttle than is normal, but the governor does kick in at around 4000 RPM. Let me put this all back together. All right, before I tighten these nuts on the injectors, we need to crank the engine over and bleed the air out of the injection system. Now you folks watch as I crank this engine over and yell at your computer screen as soon as you see the fuel coming out from one of these nuts. Anything? All right, I'll keep cranking. Okay, I hear ya. I think most of you saw the fuel coming out from around this nut, and well, that should be good enough. Let me tighten these injector nuts and then we can start the engine. Well, everything looks good, no fuel leaks, and of course the engine's running again. Let me put everything back together and we'll head over to the Hillbilly Proving Grounds and see if this modification makes a difference. Alright, well here we are. Before we get rolling, here's a few things to take note of. Yes, the right front wheel bearing is noisy, and we're aware of that. Now, there's no heat being generated by the bearing, so at this point it's just noisy. The ambient temperature for today's test is 55 degrees Fahrenheit, and what that means is the janky intercooler temp should be somewhere in the 70s during this acceleration run. Now, we're running 10 PSI of boost, and of course we're testing the effects of the injector pump timing modification. The time to beat is 26.96 seconds for the 0 to 55, and 31.97 seconds for the 0 to 60. Let's do this. So we shaved 2 seconds off the 0 to 55 and almost 3 seconds off the 0 to 60. Not too shabby. Let's see if the exhaust gas temperature alarm goes off. Yep. Well, let's see what happens if we crank up the boost. 
The spring inside the adjustable turbo wastegate actuator is good for a maximum of I think 12 PSI, so this time around I think we can get away with just increasing the preload, and hopefully that'll get us the pressure we're looking for. Anyway, to adjust the preload, all I have to do is shorten this rod here, and the good thing is the rod length is adjustable. I have the rod and the wastegate arm bolted together right here, and I'm using a jam nut so I can tighten stuff up, but still allow the linkage to move without binding. Now bolting this stuff together, eh, I'm not sure that's the right thing to do, but it sure makes adjusting the preload easier. I reckon for long term I should probably use a hardened steel pin or something like that, but since we're still experimenting, I'm okay with the nut and bolt arrangement. And like I mentioned earlier, this time around we won't be adjusting the fuel because I want to see if more boost helps reduce the exhaust gas temperatures. Okay, we're back to my improvised speedway. I had to pick a different road this time due to the school buses and the minivans full of kiddos that are occupying my normally barren wasteland that I call the Hillbilly Proving Grounds. I think on this road, we're actually going uphill slightly, so it's going to be a challenge. I also apologize for the lighting, but it is what it is. Now as a special treat for you folks, I installed a boost gauge right in your line of sight. So to be clear, this boost gauge is perfectly synchronized with the main video. Now if you watch the boost gauge closely, you'll see that it acts a little funny. No, not that kind of funny. What I'm getting at is, the boost gauge gets a little wacky because the engine's ultimately still under the control of the governor, and when the governor pulls the throttle back, well, we lose boost. Meh, it's interesting, but it's not something I'm going to fix. The ambient temperature is 64 degrees Fahrenheit, and we're running 12 pounds of boost, if the governor will let us. Alright, enjoy. Looks like from 0 to 55 we shaved a little bit more than a half second off our time. And from 0 to 60, well, once again we're a half second faster. That's good, but I think it should be better. So maybe we do need more fuel. Let me take a look at something. Ah, I think I see what's going on. You see, once we hit 60 miles per hour I shift into fifth gear, and even though the engine's still under a load, the RPMs drop and, well, the turbo slows down. At this point, it just can't make enough boost for the amount of fuel we're feeding the engine. So this snapshot is showing the boost a few seconds after I shifted into fifth gear, and even though the accelerator is floored, we just don't have the boost that I was expecting. Now the boost will eventually hit 10 PSI, but by then the exhaust gas temperature alarm has already gone off. So in other words, the exhaust gas temperature alarm is going off in fifth gear after we completed the acceleration run. However, it looks like we still have the full 12 PSI boost when in fourth gear, so perhaps we do need to increase the fuel. I think we're still going to have some problems, but at least in fourth gear at full throttle we can use the extra fuel. Hmm, very interesting. We'll have to investigate this further with more cameras, but not right now. So with the semi-positive performance results, we wanted to see if the fuel economy was affected at all. The absolute best this car ever delivered was 59.36 miles per gallon, and that's before we installed the turbocharger and started fiddling with the fuel rack adjustment. Now way back then the car was certainly drivable, but getting the car up to 55 miles per hour took 40 long seconds. Now we're able to get to 55 in 24.37 seconds. That's a significant improvement in performance, even though it's pathetic in all regards. Anyway, as we did more modifications to the engine, the fuel economy went down a little bit every time we checked. The last time we checked, the car got 58 miles per U.S. gallon, and I reckon that's pretty good, even though it's slightly less than the high water mark of 59.36. So today, let's find out if the fuel economy went up or down. So here are some things to consider. Even though we increased the boost, well, that shouldn't have much of effect because the turbo only generates max boost at full throttle, and during our fuel economy run, the turbo was pumping out a modest 4 to 5 PSI at cruising speed. 
Now, speaking about cruising speed, well, this time around we drove a little bit faster. Previously, we tried to keep the car at around 60 miles per hour. However, today the car really wanted to go 64, so that's how fast we drove. Now, at 64 miles per hour, the engine was chooching along at peak torque, which is about 2600 RPM. The janky intercooler did its job, and throughout the test it kept the air in the mid-70s. So today we managed to drive 100.2 easygoing miles and consumed only 1.69 gallons of fuel, and that works out to be 59.28 miles per U.S. gallon. So it looks like we have a slight improvement in fuel economy, but it's hard to say if the improvement was from advancing the injector timing or from the intercooler, or a combination of both. So, not a bad day at the office. Overall, we saw an improvement in performance and an improvement in fuel economy. Now, as I mentioned in previous videos, we didn't build this car for fuel economy, and our interest is actually in performance, if you can believe that. Now, personally, I'm surprised the car does as well as it does in both performance and economy. <laughs> well, the performance ain't all that great when compared to a Geo Metro, but given the size of this engine and the weight of the car, performance is not too shabby. Now, some of you may be wondering, what's the top speed? Hmm, well, <laughs> off camera, we may have accidentally got the car up to 76 miles per hour, but that's a topic we can't discuss on the internet. And since we have no proof, well, it may or may not have happened. All right, well, let's take a look at the improvements we made today. In episode 7, we ended the video with record times for the 0 to 55 and the 0 to 60. For the 0 to 55, we scored a 26.96 second time, and for the 0 to 60, the 719cc Saturn managed to pull it off in 31.97 seconds. Alright, well, let's put it right here. Today, with the modifications to the injector pump timing and a little bit more boost, we zipped our way up to 55 miles per hour in a mere 24.37 seconds, and a few moments later, we hit 60 in 28.51 seconds. Now, would increasing the fuel have helped? I think so, but we're approaching the limits of this machine, and I want to be cautious before I start throwing fuel at the problem willy-nilly. So as you can see, we made improvements and a little Kubota engine still intact. Not bad for a 719cc compressor engine out of a refrigerated semi-truck trailer. Now, the acceleration test may be a bit stressful on this little engine. However, cruising down the road with the turbo pumping out a mere 5 PSI boost, well, the 2,046-pound Saturn Coupe managed to get 59.28 miles per U.S. gallon, and that's slightly better than the 58.02 miles per gallon we started the day with. All in all, not too shabby, and I have to say this, the car is actually really fun to drive. Hmm, interesting. The more power the engine makes, the more fun the car is. I think I see a trend. Well, once again, I had a lot of fun pushing the limits of this diesel-powered Saturn, and I think it's possible to push it a little bit harder by adding some more fuel at full throttle. I hope you enjoyed this video as well, and I'll look forward to seeing you again. Until next time. <laughs>